Alright, so before this next episode gets started, I wanted to quickly catch you guys up on what has happened between the end of the last video that went up on YouTube and this next video that you're about to watch, uh, hopefully here on, on YouTube. So essentially, the last episode that went out was kind of the first hour of what ended up being a four hour stream over on Twitch. And the reason that I didn't include the last three hours of that stream is that the last three hours were almost entirely me auto crafting all of the parts required to make the fusion control computer, which ended up being extremely tedious and extremely repetitive. It was a lot of coming over to the pattern terminal, shift clicking in a recipe, encoding that recipe, putting it into a molecular assembler, coming back, finding another recipe, shift clicking in that recipe, encoding it, putting it into an ME interface, finding another recipe, realizing that we needed a new machine, building that machine, making a new interface, putting the interface down, encoding the pattern, rinse and repeat over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And so if that sounds like your deal, if you're into watching me auto craft for hours at a time, I'll put a link in the description down below with the timestamp so you can catch up right where the last episode left off. But for everybody else who doesn't want to watch three hours of auto crafting, I'm gonna do a quick recap of everything that I did at the end of the last stream to hopefully bring you all back up to speed. So the first thing that I made is this guy right here, the Emmy interface terminal, which is in a bit of a janky place. And I'll probably move this um, at some point going forward. But essentially, this allows you to view all of your Emmy interfaces all in one location. So you can see we have like our alloy smelter, our assembling machines, we have our grinder, we have some new machines that I'll get to in a second, and we have all of our molecular assemblers. And as you can see, there are a ton of recipes here uh, that weren't here before. There was so much auto crafting uh, that had to be done. Um, and this just makes it a lot easier if you have a pattern uh, to put that pattern into the right ME interface, right? Especially uh, when you have setups like uh, these ones over here where you can't actively get to the ME interface without breaking a few molecular assemblers, it makes it a lot easier to just put the patterns in, you know, without having to break anything. And it also makes it a lot easier when you have a lot of machines like this that all look identical. Finding the right one is a lot easier once you have uh, this ME interface terminal. You can also go ahead and just type in, for example, a grinder, and it will show you the grinder and all of the recipes that are in it. So that makes life a whole lot easier. So the first thing that we automated was the crystal growth chamber, because of course, if we were gonna get a bunch of ME interfaces, as well as a bunch more molecular assemblers uh, to auto craft with, we were going to need to be able to auto craft pure set of quartz crystals and fluix crystals. These are needed for almost all of the crafts in applied energistics. And so we felt it was worth auto crafting those uh, with that crystal growth chamber, which is why uh, it's no longer up by our pattern terminal. The only tricky part here is that there are no input and output slots for the crystal growth chamber. Everything just kind of goes into this like chest inventory here and then is turned into whatever you want it to be turned into. And uh, that does mean that we had to put down a, uh, a whitelist on the item conduit to only pull out the final products. So for example, the Fluix crystals here require charged set of quartz, nether quartz and redstone. Uh, the whitelist is there to make sure that none of those things get pulled out before they're turned uh, into the Fluix crystals. And so if we were to now go ahead and request some Fluix crystals, let's say 100 and start, uh, we should see all of the things being pumped into the crystal growth chamber. And then uh, slowly but surely, they'll get pulled out by the item conduit here and pumped down into our ender chest, which of course is uh, being pulled into the system via this import bus over here. And so that is essentially uh, the crystal growth chamber. And uh, then we got onto, of course, the fusion controller itself, which is a bit of a ridiculous recipe. There is a ton of auto crafting that needs to be done here, um, especially given the fact that in order to actually get the fusion controller multi-block working, you not only need the one fusion coil to make it, but you also need 16 more of them to form the multi-block. So all of this stuff kind of had to be auto crafted because doing it by hand would have been an absolute nightmare. But uh, we started out with the energy crystals. These are easy enough. We already had electronic circuits automated and the rest of these things didn't need any auto crafting. So those were pretty straightforward. The energy flow circuits also are pretty straightforward and they require some tungsten, advanced electronic circuits, lapatron crystals and iridium alloy plates. The advanced circuit's already done. The tungsten is being processed, of course, by the new Sagmel slash alloy smelter setup that we did in the last stream. The Lampatron crystals, again, very much so uh, like the energy crystals, are pretty simple stuff. They require advanced electronic circuits, lapis and sapphires. Again, sapphires are being processed by the new Sagmel over here that's processing everything that's not being processed by the other Sagmel and alloy smelter. And this is where things get a little bit more tricky because then the iridium alloy plate is made in the implosion compressor with TNT and iridium alloy ingots. So TNT, easy enough to automate. There's even a recipe that allows us to auto craft gunpowder with coal and overworlding matter. So that was all easy enough. The iridium alloy plate is a little bit trickier because it requires diamond dust, but again, not too bad. We can automate that in the grinder. The advanced alloy plates, again, 
are not too bad, but they are a bit tedious. You have to teach it how to make the plates in the plate bending machine, and then how to smelt the mixed metal ingots in the furnace, and then how to craft the mixed metal ingots from the select ingots required. But once you have all of that done, then you have to get iridium ingots, which for whatever reason cannot be smelted in the alloy smelter. Or at least they can be smelted in the alloy smelter, but for whatever reason, you can't smelt iridium dust in the alloy smelter. So the iridium dust here is what we ended up with because right now all of our iridium ore is being pumped through this sag mill here. And I think it might be an oversight on the part of the pack creator because it does look like everything else iridium related can be smelted uh, in the alloy smelter. You can see like the end iridium ore and the regular iridium ore and the pulverized iridium can all be smelted in the alloy smelter. But for whatever reason, uh, the iridium dust, the thing that we have can't be. Um, and so we had to auto smelt it in our industrial blast furnace, which is where uh, this guy over here comes into play. So it turns out because the blast furnace doesn't actually use the multi-block, unlike something, uh, you know, like the immersive engineering multi-blocks here that actually form into our multi-block when placed down, the blast furnace from Tech Reborn just checks that the uh, machine casing is behind it. And I know we are using different machine casing here. I'll get to that a little bit later on down the line. But uh, essentially, you can put a blast furnace on each of the four sides um, of your kind of standard machine casing block and all four of those will work simultaneously. So uh, we put down a new blast furnace back here. Uh, this one has the iridium pattern in it, so it smells the iridium and then sends it back out into the world and is currently hidden uh, nice and tidily behind that wall there. Uh, so that is basically uh, that taken care of. We did have to make the implosion compressor, which is in and of itself a multi-block. It's this guy right here. This is essentially the implosion compressor with a uh, hollow three by three cube of reinforced machine casing and the reinforced machine casing is made with advanced machine frames, steel plates and advanced electronic circuits. Again, you can kind of start to see how much auto crafting needs to be done here because we need a bunch of those um, for this machine. And you'll also notice we have a bunch of them over here as well. And so for that, we had to automate the making of advanced machine frames, which are made with carbon plates, advanced alloy plates and basic machine frames. All the stuff we made before, but all stuff I had to go ahead and auto craft uh, to get this going. Uh, but once that was done, that was a pretty easy setup. Again, much like all of the other machines, you just configure the sides to have input on the input slots and output on the output slots with auto output enabled. And then the interface can kind of take care of the rest. From there, that's pretty much the energy flow circuits done. And then we get onto the slightly more tricky recipe that we need to make a bunch of, and that's the fusion coil. So the fusion coil uh, requires these nichronium heating coils, which are made in the rolling machine, uh, but they require a material that we haven't yet made, and that is chrome. Chrome is made by smelting chrome dust in the blast furnace, and chrome dust is made in the industrial electrolyzer from ruby dust. So uh, up here, we have the rolling machine, which is set to the recipe. This one is a little awkward because you'll see there are just nine slots here. And so uh, you have to individually set the slots that you want to be filled to input. So you, like, you'll see these ones here are not set to anything, whereas like this guy uh, here is set to input. And you know, all the ones that we're going to use are set to input. And then you do have to lock it. Otherwise, it'll start putting items in like all of the other slots as well. So you want to lock it to the recipe that you're using, and then it can auto craft from there. Over here, we have the industrial electrolyzer. For this one, all I did is I taught my system that nine ruby dust and three empty cells makes one chrome. I got rid of the aluminum and the compressed air from the recipe because the chrome is really all we're after. And as far as the compressed air goes, I didn't want my system getting filled up with compressed air. And I also wanted my empty cells back. That is where uh, this guy comes into play, the extractor here. So over in here, you'll see that we have slot three set to output to the right. All of the rest of the slots are set to output upwards. So all of the rubies and all of the aluminium are going to go straight back up into the system, whereas the compressed air is being sent over to the extractor, which then pulls the compressed air out, basically deletes the compressed air, and then sends the empty cells back up into this end chest here, which of course is then set up uh, to be imported into the system. From there, we run into the reason why we have the refined machine casing here as opposed to the standard machine casing, because the chrome ingots require a higher blast furnace temperature to smelt than a regular blast furnace. You'll see we need 1,700 heat, whereas over in the basic blast furnace, we only have 1,020 heat. And so uh, for that, you have to put lava in the middle two slots. So the middle two slots here uh, by default are hollow. I did try putting lava in with just the standard machine casing. That does make it hotter, but unfortunately it doesn't get hot enough. And so you have to both upgrade the standard machine casing to reinforced machine casing and then put lava inside. So uh, we can't currently see in there, but trust me, there are two source blocks of lava uh, inside that reinforced machine casing. Then brought the temperature up to 2200, uh, high enough to smelt the chrome dust into chrome ingots. And so that is the nichronium heating coil taken care of. 
The Iridium Neutron Reflector is made with thick neutron reflectors and iridium ingots. Iridium ingots are already taken care of. The thick neutron reflector is made with neutron reflectors and beryllium, and the neutron reflectors are made from charcoal dust, tin dust, and copper plates. A lot of this stuff is easy enough to work with, teaching our system to make copper plates. Uh, it's just done in the plate bending machine and teaching it to make coal powder and tin dust is done in the grinder. The harder part, of course, is the beryllium, which is made in the industrial electrolyzer. Uh, we went with ender dust here, so you can uh, run ender pearls through the grinder to get ender dust. You can then put 16 ender dust and 16 empty cells into the electrolyzer to get nitrogen, beryllium, potassium, and chlorite. Now, we did do this in the same electrolyzer and so much like with the chrome dust everything here is pumped back into the system apart from the third slot which in this case is potassium just as kind of a byproduct of the way that we set up the uh, chrome recipe the potassium here is also pumped over into the extractor and then uh, you know deleted and the cells are put back in the system but uh, for the most part i think that's fine i don't really think we need potassium for uh, for too much but that's how we got the beryllium and that is the iridium neutron reflectors taken care of you might think we're getting close to the end, but then you look at the recipe for the advanced machine casing, and this requires more chrome plates. So now we have to teach our system how to turn the chrome ingots into chrome plates. It requires two data control circuits, which are made with four advanced electronic circuits and four data storage circuits. The data storage circuits can be made by hand, but it's easier to make them in the assembly machine. Uh, we ended up going with this recipe here, I believe, with eight emeralds and one advanced circuit, equaling four data storage circuits. So that wasn't quite so bad. And then the highly advanced machine frame requires that we automate the making of titanium plates as well as chrome plates and then the advanced machine frames that we did earlier. On top of that, you then need the superconductor coil, which requires more of those energy flow circuits, more tungsten ingots, more iridium alloys, but this time 60K helium coolant cells. These are made by crafting tin with helium cells and helium cells are made in the industrial centrifuge with glowstone and an empty cell, which is why we have uh, this guy right here. And I think that is basically it. We did add a few uh, recipes to a sag mill here uh, because for whatever reason, you can't make Fluix dust in the grinder. Like it just doesn't work. So we had to make a sag mill for that. And then I also added the tungsten dust recipe and the ruby recipe here as well, teaching our system how to turn ruby ore into rubies for, you know, the, the chrome dust and whatnot going forward. Uh, we also were kind of filling up our grinder thing here. So having the sag mill ready to go also helped quite a bit there. And I think that's finally it. It was a crazy recipe. A lot more convoluted than I feel like it needed to be, in all honesty. And again, if we look back up here at the ME interface terminal, you can see basically all of the recipes in this interface terminal here. There were so many of them, but uh, we finally got it done. And then we finally did, at the very end of the stream, manage to get the Fusion control computer and finally managed to tick off that quest in the quest book. Flipping like it took way too long, almost three hours of auto crafting. And so without further ado, I'll now pass you off to Isaac of the next stream for this episode of Levitated. In the last stream, we spent way too much time, and I mean way too much time, making more tech reborn machines and automating a ton of stuff. If we head on back up uh, to our interface terminal right here, uh, we made so many blank patterns and we encoded so many new recipes in the last stream, but finally, we did manage eventually to get the Fusion Controller computer. We now have it. However, it's not yet complete because as we saw at the end of the last stream, uh, if we want to actually uh, make it, we have to get all of the parts of the multi-block, which for the smallest multi-block possible is 16 of these, uh, these coils here. Now, since the end of the last stream, I've done a couple of things. One, um, I've added two more sets of uh, ME interfaces all with the molecular assemblers. So we now have even more capacity for auto crafting if we wanted going forward. And I've also gone ahead and moved the crafting CPUs. Previously, we had like one uh, down here, which I wasn't a huge fan of. And we also had one all the way up here, which I also wasn't really a huge fan of. Um, I've consolidated all those down and made a few more. So we now have three um, identical crafting CPUs uh, that are made up of a crafting monitor, which just shows what it's making, uh, two crafting co-processing units, which of course allow them to use all of the uh, crafting power that they have available to them with all of these molecular assemblers. They have three 16K storage cells, which is where the bulk of the uh, kind of crafting capability comes in. And then um, I added these four 1K storages just to really fill out the space like i didn't want to you know spend the resources making more 16k ones and uh, we can always replace these in the future if we need really big uh, crafting cpus you know for some really massive crafts but uh, for now this is you know fine i think it looks pretty cool um, i also started making some of the uh, clear glass here uh, you make the clear glass over in the smeltery so uh, right now i've got sand pumping in uh, to the smeltery and then uh, that sand then gets pulled out uh, into the casting basin and uh, this is kind of falling apart because now there's a uh, dark steel in there.
But uh, I, essentially, I put a bunch of sand in, that sand got pumped down, pulled out, uh, and turned into clear glass, which I've been using uh, over here to kind of cover up these uh, molecular assemblers slash ME interfaces. So yeah, that's basically what I did between streams. I did also, and let me get rid of this guy real quick, actually, both of these guys. Uh, but I did also head on back through to the overworld, and I temporarily swapped out the lens on our tier 4 minor. Because uh, if you remember at the end of the last stream, the only thing that we were missing uh, in terms of getting more, uh, of, in terms of getting all 16 of those coils for uh, the fusion controller was iridium. So I swapped out the uh, crystal laser lens here for the white laser lens, and so now we do have, hopefully, quite a little bit of iridium. Yeah, we've got 1,861 iridium ready to go there. And so if we go and try and request 16 of these fusion coils, we should, I believe, have everything that it takes to make them. It does say that we don't have the iridium there. It says we're missing iridium dust. However, I do not believe that to be the case. Ah, yes, we did run into an issue here, right? So, okay, I understand. We have the iridium, but you can't export iridium here because the iridium cannot be smelted via this sag mill. So what we need to do is we need to actually put the iridium on the back of this sag mill here, the one that's doing uh, nether quartz and the likes. Yeah, we need to put the iridium in there. That way, all of the iridium dust should make its way uh, into the system. And then as and when we need it, it will be auto-crafted in uh, the blast furnace that's currently hidden uh, behind this wall here. So let's see. If we go and once again try for those uh, fusion coils here, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, I believe we have enough. It is going to use 33,000 bytes, but we have all of the resources to make it begin. Now, I have no idea how long that's going to take. You can see it's being done over there on that crafting CPU. The uh, crafting status here estimates it's going to take 12 minutes, which is quite a while. But that's actually fine. That doesn't surprise me. There are a lot of recipes involved. There's a lot of iridium uh, that needs to be processed through the blast furnace, and it is notoriously slow. There's also, uh, as you can see by the uh, 494 ruby dust there, uh, a ton of chrome that needs to be produced. The chrome is also very slow uh, in the blast furnace. That number is going down. Uh, the number here is usually not particularly accurate. It kind of varies a, a lot. So, uh, you know, this is never really a good uh, indicator of how long it's going to take. It could take like two more minutes. It could take like 30 more minutes. Uh, that number just kind of bounces around as it wants, really. But uh, while we're waiting for that chat, what we want to work on in today's stream is moving on to this next quest line here, the quantum tunneling quest line, which says platinum might be the first man-made substance on the planet, but it clearly won't be the last. In fact, you can even borrow substances from another world. We call this quantum mining, build a quantum quarry. So if we want to get into advanced rocketry, a lot of the components here require mana infused ingots. If we, for example, look at the recipe for the satellite, it needs these mana-infused plates. And mana-infused plates are gathered from mana-infused ingots. And uh, I've scoured JEI. There is no easy way of us getting the mana-infused ingots or the mana-infused ore. To the best of my knowledge, the only way for us to get it is via the Quantum Quarry, which is a quarry added by Extra Utilities 2, which uses 20,000 redstone flux per take to generate ores from like a, a quantum dimension, right? So to build this, we need one actual Quantum Quarry and then you have to surround it with six quantum actuators, one on each side of the cube. The quantum quarry itself is made with four iridium alloy plates, which are easy enough. Our system knows how to make those. Two stone burnt, also super easy. End stone, extremely easy. One helium plasma cell, which is made in a fusion control computer. So we do have to get the computer up and running before we can make this. Uh, and that requires helium three cells and deuterium. The deuterium is made from hydrogen in the industrial centrifuge, which I do believe we now have right do we make one up here we did indeed so we have the uh, the centrifuge we can do that and uh, hydrogen is made in the electrolyzer using electrolyzed water bauxite methane or sulfuric acid i think bauxite might be the easiest one there although electrolyzed water is just water in the electrolyzer so we could probably do that as well actually and then just get some hydrogen turn that into deuterium and then we're ready to go for the helium plasma cell as for the helium three cell that is also made Oh, no, we can make that from endstone. Okay, that's actually very easy. We could put uh, 16 endstone dust into the uh, centrifuge, and that will get us one helium-3 cell. Of course, we do need six of these, but that shouldn't be a problem, I don't think. And again, here you can see the uh, kind of structure 
of the uh, the quarry, much like our uh, molecular assembler crafting cores there. And then as for the uh, quantum, oh no, sorry, we only need the one helium, uh, helium plasma cell because that's for the actual uh, quarry. For the quantum actuators, which we do need six of, uh, we need advanced alloy plating, which again, our system can now make, which is great. End rods, which we've got in abundance. Stone burnt, which we also have in abundance. The hard part is getting platinum pickaxes. We need six platinum pickaxes which means we need 18 platinum ingots, and each platinum ingot is made by smelting platinum dust. And the platinum dust is, you guessed it, made in the fusion control computer. It's the whole reason why we've been making this in the first place. And so we need to get a bunch of warfarinium and beryllium. The warfarinium is tungsten in the electrolyzer, easy enough. And the beryllium is enderpearl dust or emerald dust, but we'll probably go with enderpearl dust also in the electrolyzer. And I think we even taught our system how to make this in the last stream. So none of that's really going to be too difficult, but it does all require the fusion controller to be working. So we do kind of have to wait for this to uh, to do its thing. That hopefully won't take uh, too, too long. And I'm really hoping that this guy isn't super slow. What we could do while we wait is we could look at upgrading some of our environmental tech stuff because we do now have 2,360 ionite crystals. And so if we wanted to, I think we could potentially upgrade our solar array. And we could also go and upgrade our, you know, void all miner to tier five and then maybe tier six, you know, later on down the line. You might think that uh, upgrading the solar panel seems like a little bit of overkill given that we have 106,000 redstone flux per tick. However, um, I have been told that the chance of getting a mana infused ore from the quantum quarry is extraordinarily low. And so it's quite possible that if we do want to progress on into advanced rocketry and thus complete the mod pack, we're going to have to get multiple quantum quarries, which means, you know, multiple lots of six quarry actuators, which means so many uh, platinum pickaxes. And just on top of that, these all require 20,000 redstone flux per tick. So, you know, really, we can only run five of those uh, on one solar panel, on this current solar panel, before things get saturated. And that's not including uh, the thousands or tens of thousands of redstone flux being used by our miners in the overworld, right? So I do believe that upgrading our solar panel here might not be a terrible idea. Let me check the old digital guide once again, and let's see like how many solar cells we need for the tier five. So yeah, if we're gonna make a tier five solar array, we need 48 tier five structure frame, 121 uh, of any of the solar cells, but ideally we wanna go with the, uh, the ionite solar cells and then 12 uh, null modifiers. So let's do a little bit of teaching here. Let's teach our system how to make the tier five structure frame. And uh, to do that, we are of course gonna need some patterns. I'm gonna go ahead and request like another stack of patterns here just to have them ready to go. So we'll throw that in, we'll encode that. I think we do also need to teach it the tier four because we don't have that yet. The emeralds shouldn't be a problem now because now that we're getting emerald ore and we actually have a ton of those, no longer uh, do we have to deal with the Amadron Corporation. Uh, we can encode the recipe for nether stars. And uh, how are we doing on with the skeleton skulls? We're doing all right. Uh, how are we doing on soul sand? We're doing less all right, but I believe we can also teach our system how to do that and, and therefore make soul sand. On top of that, uh, prismarine, I think for now, yeah, we'll just teach it this recipe here and then we can put a bunch of uh, nether quartz into our system to get that going. And at that point, I think we might be good to go. Let me put all of those into a molecular assembler. And then let's see, if I wanted to request 48 tier five, Structure frame, can I do that? We might be missing nether quartz. We're missing gravel. It's actually not nether quartz we're missing, it's just gravel. And I do believe that we have 12 gravel over here. Yeah, as always, I should uh, refill for the next time I think these gravel. And uh, I should still, you know, say that we should automate gravel at some point. But for now, let's go and request another uh, 48 of these. And start. And then... All we need after that, basically, is uh, the 121 solar cells. So I think, once again, we should automate this, because I do think at some point we might even upgrade to a tier 6 solar you know, panel, and at that point I don't want to have to recraft all of this stuff again. So let's go through and encode each of the tiers here. We're almost certainly going to have to get a ton of nether quartz. I think lapis-wise we should be okay. We've got 18,000 lapis. Uh, but if we want to get all of the... Uh, uh, photovoltaic cells, we are going to have to get, I think, a ton more quartz than we currently have. Although we have been we have been processing our quartz now, so maybe we have some, actually. Let me check. Oh, yeah, never mind, actually. Given that we're now processing the nether quartz all that's coming in, we actually have 8,000 nether quartz. That's really not going to be um, an issue for us. So, at that point, Jack, can we get 121 of these? We should... I was going to say we should tear this down, although I did request 
the full amount of tier five without tearing this down. So you know what? Instead, let's go ahead and just request 121 of these. It is a little wasteful. And again, it's gravel that we're missing, but that's actually fine. It means we don't have to tear this down. It means our systems can keep going and uh, everything's not gonna shut down when I try to, uh, to build a new one here. 121, next and start. While that does its thing, let's check. Has the other craft been completed? Not quite. It's getting there though. It thinks it's got 45 seconds left. There's a lot fewer items on here now. I would be very surprised if this gets completed without any uh, any hiccups. But I am uh, I'm hopeful. All right. So that is producing 475,772 redstone flux per tick. That is enough to run many many quantum quarries, really however many uh, we like, I guess, uh, up to a point, of course, but uh, that is quite, quite the solar panel there. I'm very happy with that indeed. All right, chat, we have it. 16 fusion coils. So, 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 I think I'm going to move this. Like, I'm not going to build it here. I've been told this needs a lot of power. Let's put it, if we can, like maybe like right here. Let's view the multi-block. Can I put it here? I think I can put it here. It's going to be a bit janky. Which is not, you know, a surprise. Oh, wow, you can just right-click to build it. Interesting. Oh, there's a coil there. I can't build it there. Okay. Let's get these back. Let's build it. Maybe, like, here? We'll find a better place for it, I think, in the, in the future. I'm also, I've also been told that I should pump it up to size 7 because that increases the speed without changing the coil requirement. So we'll do that. We'll right click uh, with the coil to put them all down. Beautiful. So the multi-block is complete. You can see that it's uh, it can hold up to 696 million redstone flux. Max energy is 669 million. The input rate is 32,000 RF per tick and the tier is insane. Okay, so this is Isaac from the future talking now. I'm recording this after the stream because we ran into a couple of hiccups that took a little while to, uh, to resolve, and I figured you guys wouldn't want to watch about 40 minutes of me uh, fumbling around trying to figure out uh, why things weren't working. So the Fusion Control Computer is here. It's with all of the coils. We are looking to make platinum. We need the platinum in order to make the Quantum Quarry, which we then need in turn to get the mana infused ore. So the platinum dust is made in the Fusion Control Computer with Wolframium and Beryllium. Beryllium we automated in the last stream, so that's already set up, and the Wolframium was easy enough to automate. It's just tungsten dust in the electrolyzer, and so we added a recipe for tungsten dust in the sag mill, uh, and we also added a recipe for the Wolframium above the industrial electrolyzer. That part was easy enough. Now, the way that the fusion control computer works is that, uh, as you can see here, it says start 320 million, and then FE per tick is 8,000, time is 51 seconds. So you have to have at least 320 million redstone flux inside of the fusion controller before it will actually start uh, completing the recipe. Now, the reason that things got a little bit derailed is that I thought you had to get 320 million and that would make one platinum. And then you had to get another 320 million to make another platinum and then another and then another. That in and of itself wouldn't be too bad, but the fusion controller can only accept 32,000 redstone flux per tick. You'll see it says input rate 32,000. And so if we were going to do it that way, if we were going to get 320 million for every single piece of platinum, it was going to take forever because you can only put in 32,000 redstone flux per tick. And so despite the fact that we're producing half a million redstone flux per tick from our solar panel, it was just going to take so long for it to get pumped into the fusion controller. And that's why we have these uh, four uh, P2P tunnels here, because I believe it is 32,000 redstone flux per tick per side. And so with four of them, we can actually pump 128,000 redstone flux per tick in total. Now that's still quite slow. Uh, but it turns out that I was actually completely wrong. And the way that it works is uh, if I get some Wolframium and some uh, Beryllium here, it actually does take 320 million to start. You'll see it pulled it right out there. But once you've spent that 320 million, so long as you have all of the Wolframium and all of the Beryllium in the Fusion Control Computer, it will turn them all into Platinum. You don't have to keep putting the 320 million in. It only requires 320 million to start, and then it will keep making the Platinum so long as you keep it filled up with Wolframium and with Beryllium. So we did teach you how to make platinum here, and you'll see we already have 13. If I were to go ahead and request, let's say, 20 platinum here, we're going to go ahead and make some more wolframium and some more beryllium. That should then be pumped into the fusion controller, and it should just keep making that platinum without having to spend the extra 320 million, which makes it much, much, much faster. It does still take a while, and it does still take an active uh, 8,000 redstone flux per tick when it's in like this mode here, like once it's got going. 
but it's a lot easier than I thought it was going to be, which is real nice. It's not going to take anywhere near as long uh, as I thought. Now, the other issue that we ran into is while the Fusion Control computer was kind of charging up, my ME system kept flickering. It kept like losing power and then like re-coming online. And I couldn't for the life of me figure out why, because up here, we were still producing a ton of power. Our vibrant capacitor bank was full. You know, it's got all 25 million. And yet for whatever reason, this wasn't working. And so we made the network tool here. And if you use the network tool on the ME controller, you can actually see how much energy is being used. Right now it's using 941 redstone flux per tick. That's the amount of power being used just by our A2 system in general. And it turns out that the reason that this was flickering is because occasionally this jumps up to 7,000 redstone flux per tick. So essentially, uh, if I go ahead and cancel uh, this recipe over here, we'll cancel the new wolf radium and we'll let this guy uh, finish what it's currently doing. Once this is done, um, I believe we'll see the energy here start to go up again. And essentially, what I was not aware of is the P2P tunnels from Applied Energistics have like a 5% tax on them. So each of these here is pumping 32,000 redstone flux per tick into the fusion controller, right? And now you'll see it is going up. And if we come over here, you'll see that now we're using 8,000 redstone flux per tick, which is crazy. Uh, the reason for that is that 5% tax. So 128,000, 5% 5 of 128,000 is about 6,000 redstone flux per tick. So not only do you have to spend the power on the machine, but the P2P tunnels also use 5% of the power you're sending like through the controller itself. So the reason it was flickering off is that previously uh, we were using uh, this cable down here from Endryo, which can only transfer 5,000 redstone flux per tick. And so as soon as it got up to 7,000, which is where it's at right now, the system would shut down. And so uh, all we've done to combat that is we put a new P2P tunnel down right here. This is linked to the P2P tunnel on the solar panel. So now power is coming directly from the solar panel uh, down into here. And so now the controller shouldn't turn off until it gets you know, until it starts using more than 400,000 RF per tick, which I don't think it's going to do uh, anytime soon. We also added a dense energy cell there, which is holding 1.6 million AE, so that uh, if we do lose power, hopefully there's enough of kind of a buffer in there to keep things online until, you know, the power usage drops and, and everything's okay again. So that kind of threw me for a bit of a loop. I was not aware that the P2P tunnels had that 5% tanks. I think I'm still going to use them going forward because they are, I think, one of the best ways to transfer power, uh, especially given that uh, we don't have uh, thermal dynamics, so we don't have like the infinite energy flux ducts that you might have in some other mod packs. The best conduits that we have are the ones from Endo.io here that can do 20,000 RF per tick, which in most cases is fine, but in some cases it's not. And so, yeah, just bear that in mind if you're going to work with P2P tunnels, they do have a bit of attacks and you might want to check uh, using the network tool, like how much power your, uh, your system is using if it starts to flicker on and off. And so, yeah, that's essentially everything that I did for the remainder of this stream. We troubleshooted the controller and we got the uh, Fusion controller here working as well. And now we do have the Platinum ready to make at the Quantum Quarry in the next stream. For now, though, guys, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video and you haven't done so already, you can hit the like button to let YouTube know that this video is uh, hopefully worth watching. You can also subscribe if you haven't done so already to get notified as soon as new videos go out. As always, thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time.